tag team match, the Valiant Brothers against Bruno San Martino and this gentleman on my right, the biggest professional athlete in the world, Andre the Giant, 7'4", 425 pounds. Andre? 4'44". 4'44". Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, Frank Valois, Andre's uh, personal uh, protege and uh, interpreter, will be with us. First of all, Andre, what about the everyday things like uh, hotel beds, uh, cars? Do you have any difficulty? Well, in the hotel, I bring the king size bed. You bring a king size yeah, bed? Yeah, sometimes a king size bed, I put two beds together. So you bring your own bed sometimes? No. <laughs> all right. you, what about cars, driving? I know how to car. I go to the plane. I thought in the first class in the plane. Uh -huh. That is better. Were your parents big? What size were your parents? No, my. But you just get on my family. I'm the only normal. He says in his family he's the only normal person. All the other ones are below seven feet. So he thinks he's the only one normal. We're not normal, according to him. Oh, we're not normal. <laughs> I, now, Andre, if we can get a Andre is seven four. Frank is six four. And I'm 5'7". <laughs> so, <laughs> what about girls? Uh, any problem with Oh, no, no huh? problem. No problem. Yeah, no. Small ones, tall ones? Small ones, you just find a problem because you're not tall. He says the only problem he's got is not the size. He's got too many girls around him. Too many girls. <laughs> what about other sports, Andre? Did you ever consider football a good defensive tackle? Or? No, I played uh, soccer in France for four years and one year in rugby. Well, look, I want to wish you good luck tonight. and. Uh, Against the, uh, you. I'm almost there. I'm wait a minute, wait a minute. Get it, wait, excuse me, let me. <laughs> <laughs> so long, folks. See you later. Take care, Andre. <laughs> we run pulling punches. This is why you have to see the film. I mean, you will actually see us in the rain fighting. I mean, body punching. Pull it now. No. <laughs> I didn't mean no harm. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't I didn't do want to that. say I was going to do that. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. That's wrong. You, I thought I'd hurt you. You wouldn't put that on TV, would you? Yeah. I didn't want to tell you because you might have asked it for it. Yeah. I wanted to surprise you with that. Hey, look, did you go? You can put that on TV. Yeah. You got that? Did you film him on the floor and all yeah. that? Yeah. People are going to be laughing. Let me just throw some things at. Did, did you feel better in the daytime than nighttime playing day ball and night ball? Any? Well, we didn't. We never had a chance to just play one one all the time. Uh, it, like in Chicago, I would have liked that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, all day games that would have been great. <laughs> but uh, what we would do, the way we was doing it, was terrible. You know, like especially like if you was out on the coast. I remember one time we was playing uh, in Anaheim. And it was on a Thursday night. It was our breakaway day. We had a night game in Anaheim. By the time we got back up to the LA International Airport, it was like 1 o'clock in the morning. And we had to fly all the way. We had a five-game lead on Baltimore. We had to fly all the way from LA to Baltimore and play a four-game series. Friday night, no, five-game series. A twi-night doubleheader on Friday, a day game on Saturday, and a doubleheader on Sunday. And they won all five games. Knocked Gosh. out a five-game lead. Then later on in the season, they had to do the same thing and come to Yankee Stadium, and we beat them four in a row. So, <laughs> you know, that that really didn't make a lot of difference in those hmm. days. What was that, about 1960? I think that was 60? I don't know what year it was. Yeah. When you first came up, uh, if you struck out, you you got a little upset sometimes, right? Took it out. Oh, yeah. I, I hit the... I remember one time Casey uh, even bought one of those uh, Joe Paluca dolls. You know, you stand on it and hit it and knock yeah. it down, it'll fly back up. <laughs> Told me to hit it instead of those walls and those water coolers, you know, because I was breaking my hands up all the time. <laughs> uh, I, I see films now of me when I used to strike out, you know, and uh, in those early days like that before I got broke of it, uh, I'd strike out at home plate on the third out and walk all the way to the outfield. You know, this is when we used to leave our gloves yeah, right, the, right. around the infield, walk out, pick up my glove. It was terrible. I, Hank Bauer and uh, Gene Woodling, the other the other two outfielders, used to tell me, "said well, man, that looks terrible. You got to quit doing that." You know. Hmm. That was great, though. You had guys like that 
to 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 help you out. I mean. Uh, oh yeah, they yeah. they would. Uh, Casey really didn't have to run the team. You know, I mean, the other guys like Ali Reynolds and Lopat, Bauer and Woodling, Yogi. I mean, if you uh, if you hit a ground ball and didn't run it out, hmm. you're afraid to come back into the bench. You know. <laughs> That's great. Oh yeah, it's good. I mean, it's good for the yeah. team. Yeah. The it's, team ran itself, really. Huh. It's a little different now and uh, Well, you don't really yell at yeah. each other that much, yeah. I mean. You told a story about uh we were talking one time about uh the toughest guy you ever faced and you you told a Drysdale story about uh that uh, I think before an All-Star game or a well, World Series. Any time he's pitching to you, you know, like before the uh in spring training or before an all-star game or in the World Series, he always come up and watch the other, watch us hit. And uh, we were friendly, you know, and he always, he used to come around during batting practice, and he'd come up to me and punch me and say, where would you like to have one today, you know? <laughs> and he wasn't kidding either. But you know what I found out since I've talked to you, Warner, uh, I used to always say Drysdale and Colfax were the two toughest pitchers. Besides, you know, we had guys in the American League too before score, score got hurt. and. We had a lot of guys. Um, there was an old guy named Walter Masterson when yeah. I first came out. He used to strike me out every time he saw yeah. me. In fact, when I got sent out, when I got Casey had to send me back to the minor leagues in 1951, he struck me out five straight times up in Boston. Uh, anyway, I used to always say Drysdale and Colfax or Masterson, somebody like that. Well, about a, six months ago, I live in Dallas now. The Dallas Morning News always has something in a, on the sports page that says, did you know that? Mm -hmm. and that's the caption, you know, and then it'll tell you something you don't know. And for no reason at all, I don't know why they had it in there, but it said, did you know that? Dick Raditz pitched to Mickey Mantle 66 times and struck him out 44. And I didn't even realize that, so I guess I'd have to say Dick Raditz. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know What'd you do the other 20 times? Hit home runs? <laughs> I hit a home run off of him one day, and uh, it, it didn't mean anything. It was, he, he, they beat us like seven to one or something. And somebody asked him about it, say, hey, you know, you, you've been doing pretty good on Mantle, said he hit a home run. He says, yeah, I'm glad he finally hit one. He said, I was getting too cocky with him. He, <laughs> he might have hurt me in a close game sometime. <laughs> When, when you first came up, Cliff Mapes wore number seven. Is that right? Yeah, Bobby Brown was number six, and he was in the service. And uh, when I came up in 51, you know, they was writing that I was going to be the next Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and Joe DiMaggio all rolled into one. So Pete Sheehy, the uh, clubhouse guy, just ordinarily, like, Ruth was uh, three, three, and Gehrig was four, and DiMaggio was five. So he just automatically gave me six. Well, when Bobby Brown come back out of the service, he said, hey, that's my number. I want <laughs> so they gave, they gave him back number six and gave me seven. Huh. That, that didn't help you much, uh, you know, papers comparing oh, no, you all. That's, that's the worst that's thing that could have happened to anybody. You know, I was only 19 years old, and in spring training, I, heck, I must have hit 1,500, I mean, 15 home runs and had about 50 RBIs. I had a, the best spring I ever had in my life, you know, hmm. the first year. And it looked like that I might be what they was talking about, but it never did really happen until about 1956. I won a triple right. crown and finally got some of the fans off my... Plus, they were saying I was going to take Joe DiMaggio's place. You know, that's not very <laughs> no. nice to put on somebody either. Was that uh, a cordial relationship, uh, DiMaggio and yourself? When you well, first yeah, it was, yeah, it was his last year, and mm -hmm. he knew it. You know, he was through. He, yeah. uh, we weren't like... Buddy buddies like mm -hmm. me and Whitey and right. Billy Martin uh, or some Hank. But uh, if I would have asked him, you know, hey, Joe, uh, what did I do wrong there? You know, he, he'd tell you, you know. Mm -hmm. But neither one of us was very outgoing, you know. Mm -hmm. They wrote that some of the writers, when I first came up, wrote that I was aloof. I don't even know what that means, but uh, <laughs> if it means scared, well, that's right, yeah. you know. That's right. That's right. That, that's right. That's a good point. Uh, how about that drain pipe in the in the World Series uh, in '51? Uh, you were you were in right field. I was playing. Right? DiMaggio yeah. was playing center, center. and uh, before the game, Casey had come by and say, "You know, Joe had. Do you remember he had that that special Spur shoe and had a, something on his heel, and he wasn't supposedly wasn't getting around very good. And Willie Mays hit a pop fly into. Well, Casey had said, "You know, take everything you can get to right center, because the big guy was not moving mm -hmm. around that good." And uh, Willie Mays hit a pop fly, and I was running as hard as I could over to get it. And uh, when I got there, he was already standing under it. He was getting around a lot better than I was. 
He was standing there. He said, "I got it." And so when I tried to stop, I hit that drain pipe, and it just it tore my right knee out. Mm. Could you have played football, Mickey? Oh yeah, I could have went to OU uh, on yeah. a scholarship. Yeah. I wasn't I wasn't a headbutt or anything, but mm -hmm. I could outrun everybody. You know, I was real fast. Mm. You ever think about uh, if you would have made it? And, uh, no. Forget it. Who cares? Yeah. I, I couldn't <laughs> play baseball with my legs. How could I yeah. play football? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, you're speaking of Willie there, and, and when Snyder was in uh, Brooklyn, did you ball it? At, did you check the uh, box scores? Would you? Oh yeah. Yeah, was, you did. Uh, I was aware of everybody comparing <laughs> yeah. us all the time, you know. But that was yeah. good, I guess, right? Uh, yeah, it was. Except that I wasn't winning that much, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I had two or three years. It was better than both of them, though. Yeah. So. Now I speaking did. of winning, now, now, from from uh, 51 to your to 64. You were in the World Series every year except uh, 54 Twice. and 59. Yeah. I mean, it was like... Uh, we won over 100, 100 games one of those years. You know, we won 104 games in 54 out of and, 150. That's right. And what, 154? 154. We won 104, only lost 50 games. Yeah. Cleveland beat us. <laughs> they won 111, I think. I don't think Boston beat them at one time that year. Hmm. That's when we used to play 11 and 11. Yeah. But it was like... The World Series was an extension of the regular season for you. Yeah. I mean, you actually expected to be, and I would think, didn't you know? Yeah, we yeah. we thought we was going to win yeah. every year. Yeah, until '65. Yeah, uh, yeah. About the about 1964 is when everybody started getting old. You know, like Yogi and everybody just kind of mm. just left. All of a sudden, I was the only one left there. Mm. Now, in, in your book, uh, one of the points you make that. Uh, maybe if you'd taken care of yourself, you, you would have lasted longer. Uh, like, but I was thinking, would you have, if they had the designated hitter, then would you have uh, gone on? No. no. Uh, they'd, they'd already put me on first base to uh, try to keep me out of the outfield. You know, they said it was to save my legs, but it was to uh, get somebody out there that could shag flies. I couldn't run anymore. I couldn't score from second on a single hardly, and I couldn't, I surely couldn't score from first on a double like I used to. It was just, it was just getting embarrassing, you know, and I, I wasn't hitting that good anyway. Like mm. I said, there was nobody else to, uh, all they had to do was walk me and we couldn't score after, <laughs> after 64, you know, so I never got a good ball to hit. Mm. That's, if, if I have one regret, that's probably it. Uh, I didn't hit 300 for a lifetime, and up until 64, I was hitting well over 300. Mm -hmm. And the last, uh, last four years, I just, uh, you know, I just kept going down and down and down because I never got good balls to hit. I walked over a hundred times, just about every year, you know. Hmm. When Bowie Kuhn uh, took you and uh, Willie Mays out, did, I mean, this is old hat now because you uh, both took care of that situation. But one of the things was that uh, here, here, here they would let people, uh, guys with drugs. You know, they, they could stay in the game, but, but you couldn't. I mean, did that thought uh, occur to you at that time? No, the thing that got me more than anything about it was that when he banned me from baseball, I wasn't even in baseball. You know, I wasn't doing anything in baseball. I might have been going to spring training with the Yankees for a week, which was just a paid vacation is all it was, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I got banned from, I guess. Uh, I don't blame him. He told me that if, if I took the job, you know, he, he'd already banned Willie. And yeah. I got a letter, a hand-carried letter to me uh, that said if I took that job down there, I was going to be banned. So I don't really blame uh, Bully Coon except for the fact that I wasn't in baseball. And he didn't check it out. If he'd have checked out what I did down there, he would never have banned me because <laughs> I didn't. it wasn't like I was a shill or something. Right. You know, so they come in and lose your money. In fact, I hardly ever went into the, Casino. the casinos. I did more uh, charity work after I joined. People found out that if they would call the... You know, I'm not with the Claridge anymore. Mm -hmm, right. I don't know if you know that. Uh, they found out if they would call the Claridge, the Claridge would send me, like uh, I, they always say, on behalf of the Claridge, here's Mickey Mantle, to the Jimmy Fund and mm -hmm. to the Save a Heart campaign, the Special Olympics. I did more work like that after I joined the Claridge than I ever hmm. did in my life. Mickey, uh, do you mind talking about the COPA thing? I mean, that's people usually laugh at it now, but... Uh, I'll tell you the truth, Warner. I can barely remember being yeah. there. It was, <laughs> <laughs> I remember that uh, there was a, a bowling team came in, about ten guys, and they was feeling just about as good as we was. And uh, of course, there's 
started yelling back and forth, you know, and uh, next thing I knew, everybody was in a cloakroom. <laughs> I never did see anybody get hit, tell you the truth. Did the fans uh, after that, like on the road, did they uh, kind of razz you when you were in the outfield about the Copa thing, Jerry? Mm, no? No, I don't think so. No, I don't no. remember it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't. Right. Uh, the home run you hit off Chuck Stobbs, Griffith Stadium, was it? Uh, at the time, they never measured baseballs. It, that's, this was the first that time. That was the first. Yeah. That's what they, they say. That started the tape measure homer. Right. Was it Red any, Patterson was the Yankees publicist. Anything you can remember about it? Does, did you realize <laughs> that, hey, this is going to be one of the longest? Well, I didn't have any idea that it was going to go measure it or anything like that, but I knew I hit it good. And it, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to Griffith Stadium. I was born in Washington. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it, in those days, like that ballpark, if you got a ball up in the wind, the wind helped it, you know, right. because it's just like one story. And the wind was really blowing out that day, and I really did hit it good and got it up in there. And it, it's just like a golf ball. When you hit a golf ball good with the wind, it goes farther. Mm -hmm. It hit the corner of the uh, national bow yeah. sign there. I think Billy hit a home run that day, too, didn't he? He did. Yeah. <laughs> He, uh, in fact, he won the game. His homer won the game later on in the game. And uh, the next day in the paper, it was talking about how far I hit that home run and everything. All the whole write-up was about my home run. Down into Billy said down at the bottom, it said, P.S. Martin also homers and wins games. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, the funny thing about the home, he was on third base when I hit the homer. And I used to have, I don't know if you remember it or not, but I used to have a bad habit of ducking my head, you know, like it embarrassed me to hit a home run. Right. I didn't like to show up a pitcher, you know. That's one thing I can't stand today, like when a guy hits one really good, you know, and just stands there yeah. and watches it go out. And then they wonder why the pitchers throw at him, you know. I mean, if I was a pitcher, I'd throw at him the next time up. I mean, if they stood there and showed me up. Anyway, I was running around uh, from from home to third. I get to third, and I hear Chris City Hart, look out. And I look up, and Billy was tagged up at third like, he, <laughs> like it was a fly ball. <laughs> Speaking of uh, throwing, did, did uh, pitchers throw at you? Did you have anybody? Did you? Um, once in a while, they would get mad, uh, especially like in uh, '60 when Roger hit 61 home. I hit 54 right, right behind him, and there was some mad guys out there when I came up a lot of times. Most of the time, early in my career, though, I used to bunt a lot, you know. Right. And I could run out, run oh, anybody, yeah. and uh, they would be playing me, you know, second baseman and first baseman would be playing me back in right field, and I used to have that drag, drag bunt, bunt, yeah, and that would make the pitchers mad. And uh, if I bunted and got on and stole second and scored, it really made them mad. And then the next time I come up, they would throw at my knees, you know, and make me jump back. Always trying to, but I like that better than yeah getting beaned. How about early wind? Did he? Uh, yeah, he would throw it, at yeah. you if you hit a ball back at him, or and he also uh, he would if you if you got a, if you hit a ball back at him and almost hit him or something, he would tell the first baseman to get behind you. And act like he's going to try to pick you off, and he'd try to hit you with it when you're on first. <laughs> uh, how about now? 1956, you won the triple crown: 353, 52 homers, 130 RBIs. 57, you hit 365, 34 homers, 121 RBIs. And this is the season after the season that George Weiss, uh, you asked for a raise, but. Uh, well, what what happened in 1956? I was only making up until 56. I was only making 32,005. Uh, when I led the league in everything, I, I held out to uh, to double my contract, 100% raise, and it made him mad. And so the next year, the first con after that, like the after the year you're talking about right. there, uh, the first contract I got was for a cut. <laughs> like a ten thousand dollar cut after you hit the and I thought I got somebody else's contract. I couldn't figure it out. You know? well, I was the most valuable player too. You know, in fit that was the second straight year. 50, I was the most valuable yeah, player. Fifty-seven. And the first contract I got was for a ten thousand dollar cut. So I called him up and I said, "What's what's going on here?" And he said, "Well, you didn't do as good as you did last year." <laughs> so he's going to give me a cut. Anyway, I only got a ten thousand dollar raise. That's when he said he was going to trade me to Cleveland for uh, Calavito and. Uh, score or something like that, you know, which probably would never have happened, but I wasn't going to take a chance on going to Cleveland, so I signed Jeez. Yeah. And you didn't have agents in those days. I mean, you, oh, no. You think he would let, he would never have let an agent. <laughs> uh, what about, uh, 
we were talking about Brooklyn before. Uh, w w there's a story, you, you went on the Happy Felton show, and it, it, you had to go through a... Uh, uh, in the back of a bar. Right. <laughs> the star of the game, when we used to play the Dodgers in the, uh, sub, like used to call it Subway Series, right. the star of the game always had to go to, uh, it wasn't Happy Felton, though, was it? That was the Knothole Gang, wasn't it? Or was, uh, did he interview the uh, I ball thought player? so. No, I think what? Mickey's right. I think the Happy Felton was like a pregame. Yeah, that's oh, a pregame. Oh, oh, oh. Star game. Star it's the game. same deal. Star of the though. game, right. Yeah. This is like uh, whoever's doing the, uh, well, be Quebec and Costas or somebody right, like that. Right. Uh, they had the, they had a studio set up like here, but it was in the back of a beer joint or something there in Brooklyn, and it was pretty mean. And you know, you got to go in there in your uniform, Yankee uniform, and uh, that's not a very very nice place to be right after you beat the Dodgers. <laughs> Anything ever happened? I mean, guys oh, holler at you? Just, yeah, oh, they really rotten stuff. Yeah, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, you had two policemen with you, and you just, they just kept, keep going, keep going. <laughs> oh. Uh, Larson's perfect game. Now, you would have a view right behind Larson. Do you think the last pitch to Mitchell was a strike, the called strike? Well, I'm out in center field. Yeah. I couldn't. No. <laughs> I couldn't see Yogi jump for that. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was uh, close. Yeah. I, we once talked about the fact that, especially uh, myself growing up in Washington, the Yanks would come to town and you and uh, Howard and Scourin, three home runs in the first game, five in the second one, and the scores were like 11 to 2 and 14 to 3. And we talked about, I always wondered, you playing the outfield in the seventh and eighth innings, how could you concentrate on these games? <laughs> you know, because they. <laughs> they it was were, hard. They, that was that was uh, it was really hard, especially if the uh, if the, our pitcher was you know, like taking too much time. When Whitey's pitching is is great, you know. I mean, he pitch a game. Uh, these games nowadays are unbelievably yeah. long, you know. I mean, everybody got to wait till they announce them to come up to hit, you know, and they saunter up to the plate and they got to dig in and all that. Uh, Whitey pitch a game in an hour and thirty five or hour and forty five minutes. That, mm. that was great. But if uh, you got somebody uh, wild like uh, Oh, Bob Turley took a long right. time to pitch, and you're ahead like 10 to 2 or something. There'd be a lot of times I might be checking out the center field bleachers, you know, and, uh, and all of a sudden I hear something, oh, <laughs> yeah, turn around, you know, you don't know where the ball is. have to look at the other outfielders see which way they're running. But well, that's happened a few times, yeah. At third base, uh, Cleet Boyer, Nettles, shortstop. Uh, Rizzuto, and I'd have to just back off of there. At uh, second base, I wasn't there with Gordon was there or Sternweiss was there. I was there with Coleman was there. He was outstanding. But I'd pick a, I would pick a guy that uh, I thought was the all-time best utility infield the Yankees ever had in every position, Gil McDougal. Mm. At first base, uh, Madley stands out like uh, he's just unbelievable. They talk about his hitting, but his play at first base is just fantastic, really. Catching, uh, I, in my ear, nobody but Yogi. And Yogi was not only a great hitter, but he was brilliant behind the plate. In center field, I caught Joe DiMaggio at the twilight of his career, but my man's Mickey Mantle. In right field, Hank Byer was awesome, just awesome. One of the best right fielders I had the pleasure of ever playing with. So I'd have to put Hank out there in my time. And in left field was a toss-up. You could throw 35 guys out there because that was the roughest left field in yeah. the whole world, Yankee Stadium. But a well, right-handed starter, starting pitcher. Well, there was a pitcher by the name of Onionhead, Vic Rashi. Oh, yeah. Not because of his overall ability. But it was awesome as, as a competitor. Uh, Allie Reynolds, tough, just tough. Whitey Ford, Ron Guidry, without a doubt, <laughs> way up there, way up there. Can I start the outfield first? Okay, outfield. I'll take uh, Willie Mays. Mm -hmm. I'll take Hank Aaron. And Ted Williams. Not a bad team. Uh, 
you had to leave out Musial because of those three you picked. Well, I left Musial out of the outfield. Ah, oh, <laughs> you're going to put him at first base. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, I'll take Mike Smith at third. Hmm. I'll play short. Okay. And here's one that you're really going to have to think about because he's a tremendous player. His name is Gene Baker. Oh, he played with you with the Cubs. Played with me at second base. I thought he was the smartest infielder that had ever been around, knowing how to play the hitters, the pitchers, uh, the finer points of the game. I learned a lot from Gene Baker. Wow. All yeah. right, what about behind the plate? Behind the plate, I'll take uh, the young man from Philadelphia that wore number 39, Roy Campanella. Sure. I was embarrassed to get out there. Uh, you know, everybody's saying go out in the field. Well, it was, a, you know, it was something I was unaccustomed to, and I was embarrassed to get out there. Th uh, you know, almost like, well, here I am, uh, uh, you know, out there doing whatever you do, and uh, they pushed me out of the dugout, really. Joe, I think uh, a lot of people aren't aware of the fact that uh, when you were 18 years old, Everybody talks about your 56 game hitting streak, but you had hit in 61 straight games when you were 18. Did that help you during the 56 game hitting streak mentally? It certainly did. You know, after all, I was my, that was my first year out there on the Pacific Coast League, and Jack Ness of the Open Ball Club at that time had set that record. And uh, I thought I did uh, very well as a rookie, and uh, right. it certainly helped me along because. Uh, uh, as they said out there, I was kind of a boy that didn't have any nerves, you know. I mean, I was kind of a deadpan guy who played the game, and uh, the way I saw fit, and uh, nothing disturbed me one way or the other. But you know, it did, really. It all was here in the stomach. Hmm. I was, it was always churning. But uh, it certainly helped me uh, during the streak here because I've had, all ex had experience out there for that. You never bunted during the 56 game hitting streak. Now, I'm sure you, you must have been tempted. The third baseman used to play almost on the outfield grass for you. Well, he certainly did, particularly the day that I was stopped with Kenny Keltner. You know, he played short left field. <laughs> and uh, I asked him one day why he played so deep, but that wasn't so bad, playing so deep because they all played deep. I said, but why did you play on the line like you did? He said, well, all I was doing really was to protect a two base hit. Well, uh, I was able to pull the ball, but I didn't think I could pull it right over the line. Of course, when he fielded the ball, as you might know, he carried him into foul territory, and it took a little while before he was able to straighten up. Mm -hmm. And it was so deep, and carried the momentum carried him off to the foul line that when he had to make the throw, he just caught me like that, you know, and uh, a slap made the difference. But he did it twice in a row. W would have been a against your grain to bunt for a base hit? Uh, not really. I was afraid to bunt because I was afraid I hit myself between the eyes. You know, <laughs> one of those type things. I had never bunted, and uh, McCarthy never asked me to bunt. Uh, uh, even in situations, he felt that I can go to the opposite mm -hmm. field, mm -hmm. and uh, so I didn't have very much experience in bunting. If I had to bunt, I'm sure that I could have played. I'm sure all I had to do was square around, just put one down there in third base, and I could have walked the first base. But uh, I wasn't quite certain whether I could do that or not. <laughs> you mentioned about not showing emotion uh, outwardly. But one time in the 47 series, Gianfrido made the catch, and there's the famous picture of you kicking the dirt. Oh, yes, yes, I was very annoyed, only for the simple reason that it happened to me quite a bit in World Series play. For instance, we were playing uh, the Dodgers one year, I believe it was, and uh, Medwick was playing for them, and he dove into the stands to come up with the ball in the second row. Mm. Another time, another time, there was uh, Enos Slaughter, and uh, uh, of course he was a great outfielder, along with Terry Moore, who was one of the great right. ones. And they made fantastic plays, you know, out there at Yankee Stadium. Of course, there's plenty of room to roam at Yankee mm -hmm. Stadium, and they made those catches impossible catches, but they did come up with them. So this is what made me uh, lose my temper a little bit at the time, and I kicked the bag, or close to the bag. Had right. I kicked the bag, I guess I'd have been in real trouble. I probably wouldn't have finished the series. Speaking of great catches, your brother Dom uh, robbed you twice in Yankee Stadium. Well, was same game. That was nothing new to get robbed because you know I did the same thing out there. We played, didn't have to play deep, but uh, balls, you know, were hit 440 feet, 450. They were just, as we use the expression, cans of corn. We mm -hmm. didn't even have to make a great catch. All we were there camped and waiting for the ball to come down. But to talk about Dom's two catches, we had the pennant cinched and maybe about three weeks or so to go. And uh, there was nothing but a private little 
there with Greenberg and myself. We uh, were battling for the uh, battling for the uh, RBI title, and uh, we're pretty nip and tuck. Maybe three RBI separated at the time. And uh, in this particular game, we're playing the Red Sox. Dom is out there in center field. And the third time I came to bat, I hit a shot out there at 457 mm. feet. And Dom was able to climb that fence and make that catch. Well, naturally, when he walked by me, you know, I gave him a little kind of a look like <laughs> I would any kind of a player, you see. And uh, that happened in the eighth inning again. I had the bags loaded, uh, and uh, I did hit another shot out there. And by gosh, but you don't make the same kind of a catch. And I had invited him to dinner that night. And... Uh, <laughs> When he came in, I opened the door. I didn't say two words to him. He sat down, we started to eat, you know, and he finally, his words of consolation to me were, Joe, he said, I could not have gone another inch for those balls. <laughs> well, that didn't help me yet. He believed me. <laughs> but I must say, let me go on with sure. the little story because I must say that Greenberg certainly took off. He had a fantastic year. I think he drove in about 187 <laughs> runs that particular year, so I think he beat me by a 20 or so. Joe, how much truth was there to the story that there was a proposed Joe DiMaggio for Ted Williams trade? And, and, and if so, how many more home runs do you think you would have hit uh, if you played in Fenway? Well, uh, the story was true uh, because Tom Yorkie and Dan Topping were friendly and uh, they probably might have been imbibing a little bit at the time at night before a game, and uh, it sort of leaked out, you know, that they were making the trade. And uh, a couple of days later, gosh, you know, uh, they heard a little rumble here and there, and they just decided to call it up. They said, what do we do? Do we make a trade or something or other, you know? And uh, So it uh, had a lot of merit, but they called it off because, mm. uh, well, I, I figured it only go one more year, and the Williams, you know, could have gone on a couple more years mm -hmm. or three or four, whatever it might have been. But as far as hitting home runs, I want to tell you what happened with Joe McCarthy. Joe McCarthy once said, well, he said, Lou Gehrig, for instance, they asked about what would Williams hit there, you know, in right, right. field or short porch. And he said, well, Lou Gehrig is one of the great hitters of all time. He said all he could do was hit 47, I believe. So there was a lot of merit, and I think possibly the same thing might have happened up there in Boston. I wasn't the type of hitter that hit the high fly ball. I would mm -hmm. rattle that yeah. fence quite a bit, right. but my home run up possibly wouldn't have been that great. I would have loved to play in Detroit or Abbott's Field, someplace like that, or even Philadelphia, or some of those places where at least you could reach it where the fence was not that high. Mm. So I would have had a lot more. There's no question about that. In your 13 years, was there one pitcher that gave you the most trouble? Oh, I had a lot of pitchers. Gave me a lot of trouble. Well, particularly the sinker ball pitchers, you know. I mean, there were a lot of those, like Trout and uh, Bob Lemon. But the one outstanding one was Mel Hotter, the Cleveland mm. Ball Club. He uh, uh, was a very fine pitcher. He was a Class A pitcher for that team. And it wasn't so much that uh, he had particularly great – he had a great curve, I must say that. His curveball was just absolutely great. But all he would do was show it to me. He wouldn't let me hit it because I was a pretty good curveball hitter. But he'd get me on the sinker. He, in other words, he'd throw the curve outside and cause he'd break the sinker in on me, you know, and it looked like a good strike. And every time I'd swing at it, it was a ball. Hit me on the fist. Mm -hmm. And this is where I had my problem with other sinker ball pitches as well. And he taught Bobby Feller the great curve ball that Bobby mm -hmm. Feller had. You know, he talked about how great and fast uh, Bobby Feller was. And uh, there's no question that he was great. And he was fast. But that curve ball was certainly a wizard. Mm -hmm. He learned all from Mel Hodder. Joe, if if you were playing today and turn back the clock and you were in your prime right now, 28 years old, and it was 1980, what, what figure would you ask for? W put it this way, what do you think in, in your heart would you be worth today compared with other ball players are getting? Mm. Well, they sure are getting an awful lot of money. There's no question about that, but to put a price tag on myself, it's just very difficult for me to do because uh, I, I didn't know what... Um, the club, uh, you know, it all depended on who was the club owner at that time, whether he saw fit maybe to uh, give you some money. It might have been a war with me and uh, probably would have wound up signing for a lot less than anybody else. I don't know. I didn't have that much luck when it came to dealing with contracts. I always wound up with a very difficult man at the top of the uh, heap, you know, like uh, Ed Barrow is a very difficult mm -hmm. man. Even when I went to see uh, Jake Rupert and 
and uh, I tried to get an extra couple of thousand dollars. He says, young man, he says, you have hit your peak. He said, as far as money is concerned, he says, now you're not going to get a nickel more. And mm. I had to sign. And that's the way we had to do it at that time because, well, they ruled with the iron arm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would think I would uh, be one of the high-paid mm -hmm. players, uh, along with uh, Ted Williams and Bobby Feller during that period of time. Uh, but I just don't know how much. You didn't use agents in those days. I mean, you'd no, we didn't have an agent. Uh, that <laughs> was uh, taboo. We couldn't have an agent. Uh, we were not allowed to have that. No. Mm -hmm. If you picked out, and this must be difficult, can you pick out one greatest day that you feel, boy, th this was the day, this was the greatest day in my career? Is uh, that possible? Or? Well, uh, certainly, uh, I had an awful lot of great days. You know, we've had some bad ones, too, but um, the ones that you have naturally are outstanding. Uh, um, for instance, hitting five for five right. in one day is... Uh, yeah, and uh, cycling the whole thing. In other words, two home runs, triple, double, and a single, mm -hmm. which were included in that five for five, uh, is a kind of a day that you say, well, that was a fantastic day. But for satisfaction, I think, and uh, one of the great thrills, one of the bigger ones, was when I came back after missing 67 games up in Boston. Mm -hmm. And uh, have it, having a great series, like uh, hitting the four home runs in the three-game series and driving in nine runs, and uh, it looked like Boston was on its way. And, uh, but we went on to win those three games. That uh, certainly was one of the big right. things that happened uh, in my career, and that's always going to be outstanding. Joe, when you played, did you feel inside? I know confidence is a big part in hitting. Did you feel that I can hit anybody? Did you feel that? Well, I could feel, I could hit, but it was always a struggle. Uh, for instance, I had to bat against Bobby Feller, and you know I had very much success with Bobby right. Feller. Hit over 300 and some odd, and all for long balls as well. But every time he went out to the pitch, there was no guarantee that I said, well, he's my cousin out there. It was always a struggle, and uh, I didn't know how I was going to fare that day. Uh, uh, no, I didn't feel as though that I can go out there and hit every time mm. I went to bat. It was, you had to, had to work for it, and I had to struggle, and I was concentrating. That, uh, some of the worst pitchers that we, uh, that experienced uh, the worst records in baseball sometimes got us mm -hmm. out with, uh, with ease. It isn't that we didn't concentrate. Uh, they may have had something out there. Or it might have been their motion that we were swinging at or something or other, and uh, mm -hmm. they had a little luck against us. So you never know. You can't tell. Besides being a great hitter, you were one of the most graceful fielders that ever lived, excellent fielder, and you had a tremendous arm. Well, I hurt my arm in 1937. I really had a great arm, but I did hurt it in 1937. That was due to reporting the spring training late. And um, uh, I got off the train, and Joe McCarthy, who was our manager, greeted me at the uh, train, and he said, Jerry said, I got your uniform with me. He said, we're going over to this is spring training. We're going over to play the Cincinnati Ball Club in Tampa. He says, I'd like to have you play. So I thought it was kind of strange, you know. I mean, after all, my second year in baseball, major leagues, that I'm just reporting. But he had me out there, and uh, as it would be, uh, there were three balls hit consecutively, uh, successively left center and right center. And each time I had to go all the way to the fence to make the, to retrieve the ball and make the long throw. And about the third time, my arm just cracked on me. Something went in my shoulder, and I felt it. And, uh, of course, I lost a good part of my arm at that time. I would say a good 30%. Wow. Mm -hmm. I could throw it one time. <laughs> 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 Joe, thank you very much. I really appreciate this. Very nice of you. Okay. time the three of them have ever appeared on the same show together. Ladies and gentlemen, Mickey Mantle, Duke Snyder, and Willie Mays. <laughs> the same area, Brooklyn, uh, New York, Polo Grounds, Yankee Stadium. Were, did you follow each other, uh, what you did that day, or what the other guy did, or look in the paper, or listen to the radio? Duke, Willie, Mickey, uh, well, papers? First of all, I think Mickey followed me. 
<laughs> I'm not talking about playing wise, I'm talking about money wise. Uh, I remember one year, uh, Mr. Stoneman gave me a uh, $100,000 and uh, I got a phone call the next day that uh, Mick is going to get $100,000. So I think we all was right in the same category. Now people laugh at it because we're talking about playing. I'm not even thinking about playing because playing was a, a side thing with us. We were all friends. but. We stayed right in the same category as money was concerned. I don't know if... if you do, uh, do you we? Do? You got a mouse in your pocket? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, I don't you, know. I never got 100000 I'll no, tell you, you never that. Got 100, Let me ask you something. Give me some. 1954, Duke, you hit 341, 40 homers, 130 RBIs. What kind of a raise did you get off of it? You like uh, they told me I didn't steal enough bases that year. <laughs> <laughs> Probably... Seven thousand, eight thousand dollar race, something like that. Mickey, uh, you won the Triple Crown, 1956. Incredible season. Yet you had to hold out the next year, right? That uh, after that. Well, uh, that year they were pretty not. Well, I was only making thirty thousand, so <laughs> <laughs> they only had to put me up to sixty. I, I doubled my contract, but the next year is what was uh, really the worst. If you're talking about money. The next year, I hit uh, 365 and uh, drove in 100 and something runs and hit about 30 or 40, I don't know, 40 home runs. But I didn't lead the league in everything that year, so Mr. Weiss said, uh, we're going to have to give you a $10,000 cut. <laughs> 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 and because I didn't, uh, I wasn't the uh, Triple Crown winner. You know. When you guys, uh, from 1947 to 1956, there was a World Series except for 1948 when the uh, Indians played the Braves. There was a World Series either in the Polar Grounds, Ebbets Field, or Yankee Stadium, or both, or two of the three. When, when you would play in Yankee Stadium, or Duke, when you would play in Yankee Stadium, or Mick, when you had the World Series in the Polar Grounds, was that like a road game? I mean, uh, there was no train travel in those days. No, it was airport. a lot of fun. Uh, the, oh, I only played one game uh, against uh, Willie's, the guy that hit the ball that caused all my trouble. Uh, he hit a pop fly to right center. I thought you was playing center field. Then. What no, was I was playing? playing right field. DiMaggio, DiMaggio, was, DiMaggio, oh, DiMaggio. was still there. Oh, he oh, stepped you in the hole. That's how come oh. I hurt my leg. I didn't want to run into him, you know. I mean, you, know <laughs> you don't run into Joe DiMaggio, you know. And, uh, so I uh, tried to stop real quick, and uh, I stepped on that thing, and it caused all my problems. But, uh, the most fun I ever had was playing in Ebbets Field. Uh, w they used to have, you remember the old uh, gas, uh, what they call it? That guy, at Happy, uh, Happy Felton. Happy Felton? Felton, yeah. Felton oh, the, yeah. the, pre the knot hole gang or right. something like yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, the star of the series used to have to do a, a TV show and after the game, and they didn't do it at the ballpark, you had to go to a bar. Remember that over <laughs> there? <laughs> uh, for a Yankee, and I, in your uniform, you know, you had to walk through a bar oh, in Brooklyn. <laughs> to go to a back room back there. Did you ever do that? I don't no, know. No, I wouldn't go. Oh. <laughs> no way. I only went once. No way I would have went. <laughs> but I, I would never go uh, back. I'll get I, to you that. I remember a time I played in Brooklyn over there. I hit two home runs on a Sunday afternoon. And I left out of there. All four of my tires was flattened. <laughs> All four of it. I just left the car, got on the subway, came home. So I didn't, yeah, I would have known what to I was with Willie uh, about two years ago at a a public appearance thing and all of his tires was flat. He had a wreck. Wreck where? That pink Cadillac he oh, uh, <laughs> You know, there's one thing about the three of you, besides being great hitters, all three of you were great fielders. All three of you had excellent arms. I want to go back to the film and just look at three catches, one by each of you, Duke, Willie, and Mickey. All right, let's go back to the film. First, uh, this is DiMaggio batting, and Duke, this is your catch in the 49 series. Remember that shoestring catch? That was an illegal glove. It had a real spider web on it. <laughs> now, Willie, uh, this catch was 27 years ago, and people still... T Did you think at the time people would still be... Uh... I'll tell you what, before you answer that, Mickey, this is your catch, Larson's no-hitter. <laughs> Mickey, did you think uh, at that time, it was early in the game, that uh, that catch, uh, were you aware that Larson had a no-hitter at that time? It was No, not really. That's uh, probably the only good catch I ever made. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't that good a feeler. He was, uh, both of them were uh, really. 
course, he didn't have to cover much ground. You know, it was only 370 feet to dead center over there. <laughs> One of these guys, Mickey and... He, he failed in math. <laughs> Mickey and Whitey Ford was cheaters. You know? <laughs> Why? Why? Let me tell you something about these two guys. They came to San Francisco on a... Well, you remember the time we played the World Series out there in 1962? 62, yeah, 62, okay. Right, yeah. They went to the golf course, okay, and they signed everything on my boss's name. <laughs> everything. Golf shoes, golf clubs. Now, my boss wouldn't take no money. Hard stone them? Hard stone them. Yeah. Now, the bet was, and I ain't know anything about it. If you strike out, Willie, yeah. the bet's off, okay? <laughs> now, I come to bat, Whitey gets well, two strikes on story. me. Whitey Ford had never gotten him out in, a, in an all in an all star game uh, in anywhere, life or anywhere. Yeah. He's hitting like 490 off of Whitey, you know. <laughs> so they bet they uh, Toot Shore and uh, Stone him. Stone him bet, make, yeah. Make it bet. And uh, anyway, Whitey finally got him out. You know what he threw me? The biggest <laughs> spit in. I it dropped this far. <laughs> now the key to that, I'm looking I'm looking right across Whitey's head, and I see Mickey jumping up and down out there, and I don't know what he's doing it for. <laughs> I didn't know what was happening until after the game. They said, "Boy, we we thank you." You know, I said, oh. "I said, why didn't you guys tell me?" Oh no, no, we couldn't tell you. Let me ask you uh, about being traded. Now, Mickey, you played the same club 18 years. Duke, you played with the Dodgers uh, 16 years and then traded. Willie, you played with the Giants 20 years and then traded. Mm -hmm. uh, first, did you always think you were fortunate that you were never traded, Mickey, or took it for granted? And why should I be well, traded? Well. Uh, what we was talking about a while ago in 1958, the year that I thought I was going to have to hold out, I was holding out, in fact, and uh, Mr. Weiss said, if I didn't sign within a day or two, they're going to trade me to Cleveland for... <laughs> oh, <laughs> you didn't want to go Rocky there. Colavino and Herb Score, and I showed up the next day, you know. Who is a Herb Score and who? Rocky, Rocky Colavino. 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 That's Score. going to trade me for them. That's wow. his... Uh, of course, they would never... Uh, Cleveland wouldn't have done it. <laughs> but I, I showed up the next day. So I, I always wanted to be a Yankee, and I'm glad I, I stayed with the same team. Before Duke and Willie answer the question about trade, I want to go back to the film. Mickey, this film was from 1957, and uh, this, you are, this is on the holdout. This is you uh, talking about uh, 24 years ago. See if you remember this. Let's go to the film. Here's Mickey. Yeah, it was a pretty good increase. Look how little uh, you guy is. Yeah, I'm, I'm just very uh, well satisfied with everything. It's been reported uh, to be around $57,000 to $60,000 is in the vicinity. Well, I don't know. I got it. That's just like uh, asking me uh, how much I'm getting again. I can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that? Yeah, well, in those days, in those days, like, we didn't tell how much we was right. making. You know, you don't go to, like, if I'd have said I'm making a hundred thousand dollars and Hank Bauer sitting there making twenty-five, <laughs> playing right. as good as me, you know, I mean, he's going to be mad, right? <laughs> so at, in those days, you didn't tell uh, other guys how much you was making, you know, because it would make them mad. It, most, it would have made most of them mad. You know? It should uh, be that way today. What about when you were traded, Duke? Uh, how did you after sixteen years? Well, I knew I was through as a player, everyday player, but uh, I think it was the saddest day in my life uh, being a Dodger all my life and all of a sudden uh, coming to the Mets but uh, still it wasn't like being with the Dodgers and uh, I felt real bad about it and uh, it was the best thing that happened to me because uh, I learned to be humble very quick being with the Mets and losing 111. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's changed much. <laughs> Willie, how about when you were traded after all those years with the Giants? I think it was very sad for me because uh, Mr. Stoneham had often said to me uh, I would never be traded from the from the Giants, and the way I found out, I found out through Jack Lane, sports writer. <coughs> sports writer. They right. called me and said you would trade to the Mets, and mm. but I think uh, after looking back and all the things that happened, that was probably the best trade mm. for me coming back to New York, getting involved with the New York people because the, all the companies are here and all right. the people that I work for now. That I wouldn't been able to you know do all these things if I'd have stayed in San Francisco, but. I was a little bitter at the beginning, but Mrs. Joan Payson soon saw that by giving me a 10-year contract, whatever I wanted to do, so I was very happy, you know, about it. What do you guys think of uh, players jumping in the stands and all today? You, you, you never had any uh, altercations, did you? Uh? Duke had one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been volunteering, Duke. I didn't jump in the stands. I didn't say you jumped in the stands. <laughs> 
Tell you. No, we were in Cincinnati, and uh, that particular year, I think it was 1956, and the Dodgers were losing a lot of close <coughs> games. And uh, the headlines came out in the paper this one day in Cincinnati that the Dodgers were choking. But well, we played an extra inning game that night in Cincinnati, and uh, we got beaten about the 12th inning. And they, the fans were allowed to come on the field after the game was over. And I'm milling my way through the crowd as they're going out to the exit gates in Crosley Field. And, and some guy says, Duke, you don't have any guts. Ooh. Well, I turned around, and I said a few <laughs> choice words to him. And he took a swing at me. Well, he, he missed me, and I had my glove rolled up my left hand, and I hit him in the jaw, and uh, they broke it up. Carl Farilla was right there to help me out, and, uh, and a few other. Bertie Tebbets was a manager, and he saw everything. But So uh, we had to go to court the next day, and they put this fellow in jail overnight. And I got into court, and I looked, and he's 6'6". Six, six. I said, i got to be crazy to swing at a guy 6'6". Six, six. And the judge uh, said, well, I think you guys uh, should just shake hands and forget about the whole thing. And uh, so we did. I said, sure, that's fine with me. And the fellow said, well, what about the bridge that he broke in, in, my, in my mouth? And the judge says, I'm no Dennis Case to Smith. <laughs> I think that's a good one. Good one. Uh, Mickey, you were named after Mickey Cochran, isn't that right? The mm -hmm. Great catcher. Yeah, my dad uh, lived uh, for baseball, and uh, he named me before I was born. Uh, hmm. And uh, he didn't know that his name was Gordon. You know, he, that's right. Gordon. Uh, he Mickey thought his name was really Mickey, so he named me Mickey. So you would have been Gordon Mantle. Gordon so. Mantle. Yeah. <laughs> for all these years. <laughs> And I ain't got nothing about him. Uh, I don't have anything. I like Gordon. You know, I mean, I get a lot of letters sometimes uh, when I say that, but I don't, uh, I'm a lot rather be Mickey than Gordon. <laughs> How about Duke? Who, who labeled you Duke? Edwin? Well, my father. Edwin, uh, you know, Edwin isn't too good of a name either when you think about it. <laughs> but my father called me Duke as a youngster, and it, it hung on, and uh, hmm. it sounds a lot that, better. The Duke of Flatbush, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he was my idol when I was... A little kid, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yours too, right? What? You always said, you always Duke told me. We were playing way before we were playing. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. He Came was always later. our idol. When I was in Birmingham, I would look at on television and see Jack and Duke out there, and I said, boy, if I ever get up there and play with these guys, that was the best thing that happened. When I saw this guy, I was, I was in. Yeah. That was him. <laughs> Willie, you did something that uh, not too many players do. I want to go back to the film. This has got to be uh, 30 years ago. Uh, the Giants were still in the polo grounds, and you used to play your stick. Here you are. You used to play stickball with the kids, right? Yeah. In the, right in the street. Yeah, that's where I used to live at 155th Street in uh, St. Nicholas Place. There, yeah. And uh, what we we did there, I used to play stickball before I went to the ballpark and after the uh, game. And uh, we used to have ice cream. Uh, so Leo used to give me the money before I used to go there to get buy the ice cream. <laughs> so we had no problem you know, to keep me off the street. So I, I enjoyed it very much. Yeah. Let me ask each of you. Uh, Toughest pitcher. Of course, you guys, there couldn't you have been too many tough you pitchers. Need more, you need three more. Three Hall of Famers. Are you kidding? <laughs> if you guys had to pick one guy, the last guy you'd want to see in a game, who, who would it be? He didn't have to hit against my two. <laughs> my two were Koufax and Drysdale. I think they're the... Who you think I, who you think I had to hit against? I didn't say you, I said him. Oh, oh, oh. What you talking about? No, I wouldn't give anything to be I was on the ground half the time. I don't know. That's why I couldn't hit. How about you, Duke? Well, Koufax yeah. never did knock you down, he I know. He didn't have to. I never seen the ball. Yeah. <laughs> 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 kid, Koufax would have been as mean as Drysdale. Oh, Nobody could ever we never would have came down. close to him. No. That's but uh, Don, you know, he's a good friend of mine, right? Do, uh, <laughs> I, I guess. I mean, me and him are close, <laughs> like that. Yeah. But he used to come around, like, before the game, he'd punch me. In the, you know, when he's pitching that day before yeah. the World Series or an All-Star game or something, he'd punch me around. He'd say, where would you like to have one today? <laughs> <laughs> He thought it was funny to hit you. I'm not well, kidding. I'll tell, tell you about Drysdale. He, uh, he got the uh, word from the bench to walk Frank Robinson intentionally one day in the Coliseum in Los Angeles. And he says, why waste four? So he hit him with the first <laughs> 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 and The toughest guy I ever faced was Juan Marichal. Marichal. Yeah. He yeah. was very tough. Yeah. Ask our guests a question. So, uh, Willie, Duke, and Mickey, uh, anybody has a question? Yes, this gentleman. Willie, as I recall, when you uh, broke in, your first 20-some-odd at-bats were hitless. Now, were you so disillusioned that you had second thoughts about playing baseball, or did you want to say, hey, fellas, give me a break? <laughs> <laughs> I said give me a break through uh, Leo DeRocha, but I went 0 for 12. I got one hit off of one spun, 
And uh, the oh, way no. I think I got that hit went through uh, <clears throat> Leo De Rocha. And uh, I went, uh, see, I was playing in Philadelphia, won all three games, and I was crying at my fourth game. Very, very upset. And Leo came to me and he says, uh, son, as long as I'm, you know, manager here, you my son of Fielder, and don't worry about hitting. You just go out and feel. We got enough hitters for you. And I think uh, that carried me over. And I, uh, you know, I saw always like Leo. You know, there was a song written about the three of you, Willie, Mickey, and the Duke. The uh, gentleman who wrote it is Terry Cashman, who uh, also uh, wrote the music, the words, and performs it. We're going to listen to a little of it right now. Go ahead. The Wiz Kids had won it, Bobby Thompson had done it, and Yogi read the comics all the while. Rock and roll was being born, marijuana we would scorn. So down on the corner, the national pastime went on trial. We're talking baseball, Klazuski, Campanella, talking baseball. The man and Bobby Feller, the scooter, the barber, and the nuke. They knew them all from Boston to Dubuque, especially Willie, Mickey, and the Duke. Well, KC was winning, and Garen was beginning, one Robbie going out, one coming in. Kiner and Midget Goodell, the Thumper and Mel Parnell, and Ike was the only one winning down in Washington. Snyder, you Mickey Mantle, <laughs> thanks for coming. There'll be about a quarter of whiskey between the Back Bay Station here in Boston and 125th Street in New York. God knows he could have what he could have done if he'd ever kept training. <laughs> I don't think he knew a hell of a lot, but. He didn't have much of a charge. I liked him quite a bit. When you came up, you were 22. Yeah. And Ruth was 37. He came around after I'd been with the ball club a couple of days. He came around and knocked on my door and said, would it be all right if he used my room? This is before I went out to the ballpark. And I said, sure, oh, of course. And then I figured it out that he had this game with him. I went out to the ballpark and he came out about a half an hour after everybody else. And I think he hit a home run and a triple. And I said, God. That's a fine way to behave. <laughs> but he wasn't a conceited man, really. He was good fun. Nice, nice guy. Gary, on the other hand, would bite your head off if you were sympathetic with him. People say Ruth and Gary didn't get along. What, what was the situation there? I think Ruth was very nice to Gary when he came up and uh, they get, got on, but they weren't friends. In other words, they didn't, Gary didn't go and have a drink with Babe. They went their separate ways. I didn't care for Gary as much as I did for Ruth, but boy, he was a hell of a good man to have on your team. <laughs> <laughs> What about Tony Lazeri? What kind of guy was he? Oh, I thought Lazeri was great. I think I'd rather see Lazeri play than anybody I knew. He was a hell of a good hitter. And I, I never saw him make an error. He had a good sense of humor. 
Every now and then he'd throw a curveball to Gehrig on a ground ball. He'd get the ball. And I, if he had plenty of time, he'd throw a curveball at Gehrig. Get, <laughs> Didn't please Gehrig much. Yankee Stadium is a great place to play ball, too. And of course, it was built for Babe Ruth. That right field fence, you could gosh, make a fly ball and be a home run to right field. What about Babe Ruth in the 1932 World Series? Uh, you were there, you were in the bullpen. Do you think Ruth called a shot? For a home run? I saw him do that. I saw him a finger indicating, pointing towards center field. Frankie Crosetti, who I used to talk to, said he wasn't pointing at the French. He was putting up one finger because he had one more strike. The next ball he did hit there. <laughs> <laughs> he never denied it. <laughs> But I think Crosetti was right. Did you ever want to pitch for the Red Sox? No, they wanted me to. But uh, I said, no, I was going to quit. That was after I told the Yankees I wouldn't play anymore. Looking back on it, I think I was right, although it would have been fun to play some more, but I had to get to work sometime. <laughs> <laughs>